I made a video a few days ago about former Army General Eric Shinseki, and I called him the man who shall not be named. A lot of my European viewers didn't understand why I called him that. I compared him to Harry Potter's Voldemort or why he was so controversial. Maybe my comparison was a little unfair. General Shinseki guided the U.S. Army through its greatest transformation since the Second World War. The story I'm about to tell you is the story of an army that went from one of the greatest victories of the 20th century to an army that lost its purpose and eventually regained it under one man's leadership. What do you do as an army when the future is uncertain and you don't know who the next enemy will be? I can tell you this, soldiers hate two things, change and the way things are now. And sometimes people who stick their necks out to innovate see them chopped off. In order to explain this, I need to go back in time to the 1990s. And by the time you get to the end of the story, you're gonna realize that a lot of the hatred that soldiers from my generation feel toward General Shinseki is really just some petty spaghetti, unless it isn't. To start, General Shinseki served his country honorably and with distinction. His loyalty to America and the U.S. Army is without question, and his desire to keep the U.S. Army relevant through years of uncertainty was admirable. He's a Japanese American whose ancestors served in the 442nd Infantry Regiment, the most highly decorated unit in Army history. Shinseki attended the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He served in Vietnam, where a landmine blew off part of his foot, and after he recovered, he continued to serve. Now, during the 1980s, the U.S. military was massive. Our entire focus was on countering the Soviet Union. The U.S. Army had 28 divisions, if you include National Guard and Reserves. We could fight two World War II-style wars simultaneously in two theaters at once. He trained with a doctrine called Airland, or sometimes you hear it called Airland 2000, or Airland Battle, or Airland Battle 2000. The basic idea behind Airland Battle 2000 was that if the Warsaw Pact ever invaded West Germany, air and land forces would attrit those forces with land and air power until a massive counterpunch could be delivered. Airland 2000 was basically the Tom Clancy novel Red Storm Rising. But this doctrine had never been tested outside of that novel. On August 2nd, 1990, Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait with the fourth largest army in the world. Saddam Hussein stopped short of invading Saudi Arabia, although it's questionable as to whether he had the logistics to actually complete an invasion of Saudi Arabia. But this allowed the U.S. and coalition forces to build up in Saudi Arabia as part of Operation Desert Shield. Saddam Hussein messed around, and he was about to find out about Airland Battle 2000. On January 17, 1991, coalition forces launched air attacks into Iraq and occupied Kuwait. Operation Desert Shield became Operation Desert Storm, and the air part of Airland kicked in. Coalition forces pounded Iraq from the air for about a month. On February 24th, the ground war began. During air and ground operations, U.S. and Allied forces destroyed over 3,000 Iraqi tanks, 1,400 armored personnel carriers, and 2,200 artillery pieces, along with countless other vehicles. It is estimated that somewhere between 20,000 and 35,000 Iraqi soldiers were killed at a cost of 250 coalition casualties. The airland battle concept was proven. It worked, and it probably would work against the Soviets. But just a few months later, the Soviet Union dissolved on December 26, 1991. The U.S. and NATO essentially outspent the Soviet Union. The economics necessary to make the weapons and equipment for Airland 2000 essentially caused the target of these weapons to economically collapse. The Russians just couldn't keep up with production. Enter the 1990s, and things got kind of weird. The U.S. was involved in a number of smaller conflicts, Somalia, Yugoslavia, Haiti. This was the army that I entered. It was an army without purpose. We really didn't know who we were supposed to fight or who we were supposed to be training to fight. The army was trying to reinvent itself with a doctrine called Force 21. And the Force 21 experiment was kind of like that scene in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure where the football player had no idea what he was talking about. Everything is different, but the same. Things are more moderner than before. Bigger and yet smaller <laughs> computers. Damn, Davis High School football, 
Yeah, that was pretty much the army in the 90s. And if you joined the army in the 90s, you're probably nodding your head right now. The army just kind of threw the word computers at everything. And we still didn't know who our enemy was. But as it turns out, our enemy was the U.S. Congress. The 1990s was the era of BRAC, or the Base Realignment and Closure Commission. Since we didn't have anyone to fight, multiple military bases were closed, and the size of the army fell from 28 divisions to 20. By 1997, General Shinseki was serving as the commanding general, 7th United States Army Europe, and he was also responsible for the NATO Stabilization Force in Bosnia and Herzegovina, also known as S4. And while working with S4, the general interacted with forces from Canada and Finland and Germany and Turkey and... You know, there's something weird about these vehicles. I can't quite put my finger on it. Hold on, hold on. Let me look at pictures from Desert Storm again. Huh. You know, it's almost like these wheeled vehicles are really useful for stabilization and peacekeeping missions. Like, all right, I'm just spitballing here. If the world is safe from the clutches of communism, maybe all the troops really need is a wheeled box that can protect them from small arms fire of warlords and militias. Maybe throw an auto cannon on there for overmatch against tougher targets. I mean, heck, you know, tanks really aren't all that deployable without help. They need special carriers to get them from their staging areas to the front lines, or else half of them would break down, the other half would tear up the roads. But you could drive a wheeled vehicle down a highway. It would also be cheaper, less maintenance, and require less fuel. General Shinseki had a brilliant idea. The world is becoming more and more urbanized. If wars are going to be fought primarily in urban areas, because that's where the people are, maybe we don't need traditional tanks with caterpillar tracks. Put a pin in that. It's going to become important later. General Shinseki became Army Chief of Staff in 1999, and he pioneered something called Full Spectrum Operations, which essentially replaced airland battle. The idea behind full spectrum operations was to dominate all battle spaces from air to land to sea to under the sea to space to electronic. The Army also started this program called FCS or Future Combat Systems, and this was supposed to be a family of vehicles that all had a common chassis from howitzers to tanks. In Force 21, it kind of morphed into this network, computerized high concept modular. I'm running out of buzzwords here. But basically, the Army wanted to go from a division-based structure to a brigade-based structure that was lighter and more flexible. So using rough numbers, a brigade is roughly 2,500 to 5,000 soldiers, and there's usually three or four brigades in a division. And the idea was that the Army would create these special brigades called units of action that would be small and lightweight and flexible and capable of performing everything from combat with peer to near-peer enemies to peacekeeping, which at the time was called OOTW, or Operations Other Than War. And this OOTW thing was General Shinseki's jam. He envisioned a smaller, leaner, more professional army that was rapidly deployable, engaged in operations where one brigade might be fighting warlords in one sector, giving out humanitarian assistance in another sector, and building a school someplace else. And he wasn't wrong. The 1990s was the Bosnia and Serbia show, and the U.S. had no indication that anything was going to change. So General Shinseki's idea for this future lightweight modular force with new vehicles went forward. And it went forward with two concepts, the IBTC, or Interim Brigade Combat Team, and the IAV, or Interim Armored Vehicle. Now, fielding a new vehicle is incredibly hard, and the IAV, or Interim Armored Vehicle, was supposed to be able to fit in a C-130 cargo plane get 300 miles on a tank of gas, and go 60 miles per hour. And what we ended up with, the Striker kind of sort of almost did that. Innovation is hard, and it takes a leader to move that innovation process forward. And General Shinseki was the right leader at the right time. Improvements were made. The Striker today is a pretty darn good vehicle. And another thing that Shinseki doesn't get the credit for, his vision of the unit of action eventually became the Infantry Brigade Combat Team, or the Striker Brigade Combat Team, if you're a striker unit. These small, flexible units were critical to coin or counterinsurgency operations in Iraq and Afghanistan because these small units could deploy by themselves with all of the stuff that they would need to conduct combat operations. General Shinseki's wisdom and foresight made the transition from a Cold War army into a coin-based army a lot easier for the army. Now today, the army is considering changing the way it fights again, from coin, or counterinsurgency, to LISCO, or large-scale combat operations. 
Essentially, the army is looking less toward insurgencies and more toward fighting peer and near peer threat. But for almost 20 years, General Shinseki and his unit of action idea was the right idea at the right time. So why did I call him he who shall not be named? As part of the transformation to this rapidly deployable unit of action thing, General Shinseki made a change to the uniform. He added the black beret as mandatory headgear. For years, soldiers wore the garrison cap. We often called it the soft cap or just the cover. And the history of this goes all the way back to the forage cap or the kepi of the Civil War. The US Army did wear berets, but it was usually to indicate some kind of special status. Airborne soldiers wore maroon berets to make themselves distinctive. Special forces wore green berets. And Army Rangers, the same Army Rangers from the movie Black Hawk Down, wore the black beret. And that was kind of the problem. Look, everybody needs a hero. While the average citizen might look up to a soldier, the average soldier looks up to the Army Ranger. Now, Army Rangers aren't exactly special forces. They're more like specially funded forces that can provide decisive and flexible combat power for very specific missions. Since 1979, the Black Beret was a symbol of the Army Rangers. A lot of people, including me at the time, considered taking the Black Beret from the Rangers to be... I don't even have the words for it. The action was so blatantly disrespectful of that storied unit that even today people get angry about it. And I know it doesn't make any sense. Most of the people who got angry about it weren't even rangers. The rangers decided to go with the tan beret instead, and they just went back into the woods to go do ranger things. But that black beret is supposed to be earned. And General Shinseki devalued the storied contributions of the ranger battalion because in his words, the beret has become a symbol of excellence of our specialty units. But a beret doesn't make an elite army. Training does. But the choice had been made. The problem was that the switch to berets was so rushed and convoluted that the U.S. suppliers just couldn't produce enough of them. And General Shinseki demanded that every single soldier don a beret on June 14, 2001, the Army's first birthday of the new millennium. Now, there's a law called the Barry Act, which requires that Army clothing be purchased from domestic suppliers. If you look at that chest rig I have back there from Dynamic Principles, that is a Barry Act compliant chest rig. It is made 100% in America. And actually, if you want an American-made chest rig or plate carrier, you can find it in the link below. In order to meet the deadline, the U.S. Army purchased berets from manufacturers in the People's Republic of China. So maybe it's not such petty spaghetti after all, huh? Now I can get into a whole thing about the Black Beret, how it took two hands to put on. It was hot in the summer. It was cold in the winter. It didn't keep the sun out of your eyes. It made everybody look like Chef Boyardee. But really, the problem stems from the fact that the People's Republic of China, a country that is the antithesis of everything the U.S. Army stands for, made berets for the uniform of a free people just to satisfy a general's vanity. That's a pretty big pill to swallow. And that's why some soldiers don't even like to say his name. Hey, if you like my content, head on over to Bunker Branding and pick yourself up a Live Laugh Launch t-shirt in Patriot, High Mars, or even a Toe Mitchell t-shirt. It all goes to support the channel, and none of these shirts are made by communists who want to destroy America. And thank you so much for watching. It's me, Captain Bannon of the documentary Team Yankee. When I'm not kicking commie butts, I'm wearing t-shirts from Ryan Macbeth available at Bunker Branding, Knife Hands, High Mars, Landmines, Patriot, and even my favorite, the Toe Missile. Mushna, we want t-shirt too! Take a hike, commie! Ah! So come on down to Bunker Branding and take a stand for what's really important about America, capitalism!